Hello, everyone. Looks like we have a lot of people that have joined us. Uh, this is a great time for you to check your audio and visual settings to make sure that everything is working properly. And we're going to begin with our content in about one to two minutes. So give us just a moment and we'll be right back. Hello everyone. We are uh, going to begin in just a couple of minutes here. So if you haven't already done so, please take a moment to check your audio and visual settings. There are some helpful tips on the screen for how to do that. And give us just a couple of minutes and we will get started with our presentation today. Welcome everyone. Before we get started today, we'd like to ask you a couple of quick polling questions, which you should see on the right hand side of your screen. Give us just a second to get those posted. The first is, have you conducted an empowerment evaluation before? Just yes or no. And then the second is, if you have, how many have you conducted? We'll give you just a second to answer those. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Just one second. This will give us a good idea of who's attending today and just um, who your colleagues are that are on the line with us. There we go. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you are looking for some, some introductory information, perhaps. And then there are a few of you who have uh, done quite a few of these, which is terrific. Thanks so much for your input on that. Again, thank you so much for attending our webinar today. This is the second uh, webinar that we're doing in our Sage Talk series, uh, Empowerment Evaluation by Dr. David Fetterman. Uh, my name is Nicole Elliott, and I'm the Executive Marketing Manager for Research Methods, Statistics, and Evaluation at Sage. And joining me today is renowned author and evaluator David Fetterman. David is the president and CEO of Fetterman and Associates, an international evaluation consulting firm. He has 25 years of experience at Stanford University, and many of you know him as the past president of the American Evaluation Association. He's received numerous awards and was most recently honored by the AEA with their 2014 Evaluation Youth Award at the recent conference that was held in Denver, where I had the privilege of joining him at the awards ceremony. David is known as the founder of Empowerment Evaluation and the author and co-editor of 15 published books, including the most recently published work, Empowerment Evaluation, the second edition. Before I get started, I want to tell you that this webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We'll send out a link to view all, excuse me, to all registrants to view that via email after the event. And we'll also be sending out a post-webinar survey to get your feedback about what you thought of the webinar and what you'd like to see in future webinars. So please do take a moment to complete that survey when it comes to you, as we do greatly value your feedback. If you have any problems with audio or video during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the bottom or to the right of your screen, and one of our team members will help you just as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for questions from attendees. So throughout this presentation, feel free to use the Q&A box to ask any questions to the speaker. And please also note the webinar hashtag if you prefer to use Twitter. It's hashtag SageTalk. 
We'll collect those questions and we'll answer uh, the topics that seem to be the most popular and relevant to the audience um, in order that we get them. And if we have some time where, or some questions that we're not able to get to during our time today, David has uh, graciously offered to answer those questions and, and post those on our website. So we'll include the link to that as well when we do our follow-up email. And without further ado, I would like to go ahead and turn the floor over to David. Are you ready? We're gonna, <laughs> ready? We're going to be covering uh, empowerment evaluation today, and uh, I'm going to make sure you can all see my, my slides uh, all right. And uh, give one second there, and you should be able to be in good shape. Now, I wouldn't see okay. If uh, you can't, feel free to chat on the right side and let uh, folks know. But I'm going to launch into um, uh, an overview of what empowerment evaluation is about. This is the 21st anniversary of empowerment evaluation. Uh, I first introduced this when I was uh, president of the American Evaluation, evaluation Association, and uh, it was quite controversial at the time, I must say. Uh, it scared a lot of people, and now it's considered just a part of the intellectual landscape of, empower of evaluation. And uh, the collaborative, participatory, and empowerment dig, the section a uh, division of, of, of um, the American Evaluation Association associated with this uh, approach is about a fourth of the entire membership. So from an N of one to a pretty good size, it's a pretty, pretty impressive growth. Um, and as you can see from the first slide, it's an international crew. It's obviously not just me. We work in Australia, Canada, Ethiopia, Finland, Mexico, Nepal, New Zealand, South Africa. We're in Nepal over there with UNICEF uh, working with issues of uh, vaccinations. But people are getting people to assess their own performance using empowerment evaluation. Today we're going to cover the definition. We're going to spend about six or seven hours on theory. What? We don't have six or seven hours? Did, did that throw somebody? I see somebody raising their hand. Wait a second. Wait a second. No, only two or three minutes, I promise. Don't worry. I know you think of his professor, he's writing all these books, he could probably go on six hours on theory. Well, we're not going to. We'll just spend a couple minutes on that. And then we're going to also focus on the concept that may help guide your thinking when you're doing empowerment evaluation. And before we end this session, we will go over the three steps that I use to use with empowerment evaluation so you have a solid grounding on how to actually go forward with this approach. So let's start with the definition. It's really the use of evaluation concepts, techniques, and findings to foster improvement and self-determination. So this is not a neutral scientific experiment. This is used using evaluation to help people get to where they want to go. We expand the definition for a little more uh, meat on the bones with this uh, definition in our later work, uh, and that was um, it's an evaluation approach that aims to increase the probability of achieving program success by providing program stakeholders with tools for assessing the planning, implementation, and self-evaluation of their program. Uh, now, more important than that is mainstreaming evaluation as part of the planning and management of the program. Now, let me do this one second. I'm going to escape from there for a second, add a little bit more to this process, and tell me if you can see me as well in a second. That way you'll be able to get some visual, uh, hopefully at the same time. Yep, we can see you. Beautiful. So making sure you can see me, I'm contrasted with this woman I spent some time with on the left, uh, who is in a squatter settlement. So when you're using permanent evaluation, just to give you a feel for it, I've used it in uh, high-tech corporations uh, in Silicon Valley here. Uh, I've used it to, for tobacco prevention in Arkansas, keeping minority kids away from tobacco. But I've used it in squatter settlements, as you can see on the left, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we go through this process. So there is a phenomenal range of settings. But going back to the definition, what we're really talking about is providing folks with the tools to assess their programs. And the second part I was getting to, we're also talking about mainstreaming evaluation as part of the planning and management of the program or operation. So instead of being secondary and parasitic, like most evaluation, it becomes part of the process of actually managing your operation. So we'll go into how you do that, and it changes the dynamic tremendously in terms of how people see the evaluator and their contribution as well. So this definition is very important for shaping the entire uh, function of the process. 
So as I said, I've got six hours. I, oh, okay, maybe maybe a few. I'm going to hit just a couple theories very briefly just to get everyone oriented in terms of the focus of what this is about. The number one theory underlying empowerment evaluation is process use. Process use is that the more that people engage in the act of conducting their own evaluations, the more likely it is that they'll find the results credible and act on the recommendations. Why? Because they're theirs. So this is a very powerful pro part of the, the process and was a driving force in empowerment evaluation. And it's, it, it responds to the most significant problem uh, attacking evaluation today, which is the lack of knowledge utilization. Too many of our pieces, our great work, sit and gather dust on the shelves because people don't own it. People don't buy into it. They see this outside expert as not really being in touch with what their needs are, their concerns, and no real stake in the game. This changes the whole dimension of what people think about when they're thinking about evaluation because they own it. They are shaping it. Uh, they're moving forward with it. It responds to the critical problem we have in evaluation knowledge utilization. So I promised only a short period of time, process use, the driving force theoretically behind empowerment evaluation. Two more theories, I promise I'll be short, I'll be brief. Uh, I assume a number of folks have seen this before, this uh, little sign, mind the gap. If you haven't, uh, when you go to London, I did some work in London, and I go to get on the tube on the other uh, train, the subway, and uh, getting ready to go to work over there. We had some projects and some other talks and all that sort of thing. And I saw the sign and I heard this, mind the gap, kind of loud speaker going up and I'm thinking, what the heck is this? Is this, you know, for uh, gap clothing or what? I didn't know. So I get on the tube and I go off to my meetings for the day and all these projects and stuff and then come back, go to my hotel at the end of the day. And I hear, mind the gap, again, really loud. It's like, what is going on here? This time I looked and there's a foot and a half between the tube and the platform. I could have killed myself. And I thought, of course, that's when you're over-focused on empowerment evaluation. This is empowerment evaluation. Why? Because in empowerment evaluation, I'll show you how you're trying to mine the gap. Watch this. There's the theory of action. The theory of action is the espoused theory in life of an organization that says, oh, we're about equity and mom and pa and apple pie and fairness and justice for everyone. And then there's this other thing called theory of use, and that's the actual observed behavior. You found, I'm sure, as I have found, that the theory of use, people's actual behavior, does not always conform or adhere to what they say they're about. In other words, people don't always walk their talk. In empowerment evaluation, you use these contrasting theories to mine the gap and close the gap. Very often you'll find organizations are going, this way it's what they're saying, and this way the opposite way to know what they're doing. Or they're doing the same thing, but they're far apart and you're trying to get it closer together, more alignment. That's what empowerment evaluation does by using data to get informed decision making and get closer to what they're saying they're all about. So process use is the primary theory driving empowerment evaluation, and then theory of action and use. So I promise it would be short, not six hours. That was it. Key concepts as we're talking today, and I want you to think about in the back of your mind are these, and this is a piece we wrote for academic medicine where we used this uh, approach at the uh, Stanford University School of Medicine to help uh, get through accreditation, basically. The core is to be thinking about collecting evidence. That is at the core of empowerment evaluation. And using a critical friend, which is someone who is not in charge of the process, they're in charge of the process, people you're working with, but someone who believes in the program but at the same time can ask, well, what did you mean by that kind of question? Uh, so in empowerment evaluation, you're talking about that critical friend uh, that's in addition to this, uh, this process, because you're not abdicating your responsibility and saying, oh, just go off and do an evaluation. Of course, they're in charge of where they want to go, but you're helping to guide and keep it rigorous and uh, on track. In the process, you're always asking people what they mean or what's their evidence for a certain opinion or view you're building a culture of evidence. I'll show you how we do that in a minute. The core of this part of the process is that you have cycles of reflection. We call it, of course, analysis uh, as well. And then act on it. It's not enough just to assess and do an evaluation. You have to then reflect on it and then move forward with specific actions that then you can assess as well. Cycles of reflection and action. 
In the process, you're building a community of learners. It's a phenomenal, engaging experience if you haven't been immersed in this, this process because we all are learning, including me, all of us. Uh, no one knows everything. And you learn, even from your weakest link sometimes, some aspect that you hadn't thought about that helps change how the organization or how you adapt uh, to certain circumstances by creating that culture of uh, that community of learners. In the process, you're building a process so that you have reflective practitioners where we're all thinking about what can we do better at each stage of our life and each stage each day in our daily life. Um, that is when you're constantly using evaluation to have as, as a feedback mechanism to shape your behavior. Anyway, as I said, these are just key concepts I want you to have in the back of your mind as you're thinking about what we're talking about today with empowerment evaluation. One of the things I just mentioned is the critical friend. When I first mentioned this, um, I got a response uh, by some colleagues saying, David, you're a professional. You're out there on your own. You don't have assistance. People in the world, they have to just, you know, do what they have to do. This idea of having a coach is, like, you know, not realistic. So I thought, well, you've got an interesting point. And then I went home and I went, that is nonsense. I went back to the gym because my only exercise was running from my classroom to the parking lot. And I thought, this is not a good idea. So I went back to the gym to get myself a little bit more in shape. But I'm not stupid. I got a coach to make sure that I didn't kill my back. I actually did Olympic weightlifting. I'm doing the whole bit. Uh, but I'm not foolish. I mean, I want to make sure I don't kill myself. So I have a coach. My daughter, guess what? I'm going to let her ride uh, and, and jump post on a horse without a coach. I don't think so. Same thing for uh, volleyball. Uh, same thing for driving, uh, racing. And that's me over there assisting folks in uh, Arkansas on our tobacco prevention project, which I'll talk about shortly. I don't want to belabor the point, but the bottom line is we all have coaches and should have coaches. Do you think I'm going to let some of my students in the med school just go off and operate or something like that? No. They're going to be, trust me, have critical friend coaches all the way along the way. We have financial advisors that coach all the way along the way. It's a normal part. Why not an evaluation as well, is my view. The critical friend believes in the type of program but still asks the critical questions to ensure an honest but constructive critique. And this can be done for self-assessment, including across a number of grantees, if you work with uh, many grantees, as I am, with these various projects that, that we're on. Now, here's a question I have for you. I'm going to ask you in a second with a poll how many questions, how many steps there are. I'm going to tell you there are three steps. We help them, a group, come up with their mission. We help them take stock of where they are. And you help them plan for the future. Let's take the poll right now. You're going to ask, why am I asking this question? How many steps are there in the time of evaluation? Well, I kid you not. My mom is a retired professor. I check with her every morning to see how she's doing. She's on the East Coast in Massachusetts. I'm over here in California. She's 87. And she always asks me, you know, I'm teaching. She goes, or giving a lecture or whatever, did you test them? I go, Mom, they're adults. Not going to be tested. Did you test them? How did you know? So this is from my mom. There are three steps. How many steps are there in empowerment evaluation? Answer the survey, please. Do you think I'm kidding? I'm going to be telling my mom later this morning how you guys did. So give it a shot. Do it quick. And then we're going to keep on zooming on as we go into each of the, the pieces. We don't want to disappoint your mom, David. No <laughs> way. No way. Trust me. She's very cool. I would not say she's laid back, but, I would say, <laughs> but very cool. You think I'm kidding. She'll be asking me. I tell you, I, was at, I remember one conference. Uh, if you ever think any of the stuff that you do goes to your head, I was at one conference and I was giving a plenary and doing this workshop and everything else. And I, was on a, and I invited my mom to come, you know, meet her for lunch. So she said, can I come to your session? So, of course, mom, of course, no problem. I'm in the middle of the most important part of these sessions from my, my, from my view, which is after you're done and you're doing question and answer with folks. Um, and she does this. She grabs my sleeve. Hey, you don't want to be late for the next session. So if you ever think uh, any of this stuff goes to your head, trust me, my mom will just bring you right back down, down to earth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 67%, that's passing enough. That's enough of the group. Got it. Three steps. Where you go? Hey, David? Yes. I just want to 
want to throw out a quick reminder to attendees that they have the opportunity to pose some questions to you. So feel free to use that Q&A chat box that's on the right side or the hashtag uh, Stage Talks on Twitter if that's easier for you. But we're collecting those questions and we'll address them at the end of your presentation. Thanks for reminding me, folks. Please let everyone know. Uh, please take the time to you know put your questions. They'll be in the second half of this. We'll go just question and answer. Uh, and also, uh, as you just heard, Nicole just mentioned. If we don't get to your question, please, uh, and, and I don't respond to it online for some reason afterwards, email me. I take a couple of days to get back because I travel a lot, but I will get back to you. Um, I take this very seriously, and I think it's important for all of us to be learning from each other. So anyway, three steps. I'm going to go over them briefly, uh, but it's to help the group come up with their mission, take stock, and that's often all you do in evaluation, and this is also to plan for the future. Over here, mission. With the mission, I'll typically have a poster board on a poster paper on, like most folks, on a, on a um, easel of some sort. And we just ask, what are your key concerns or issues about where you want to go? What are you about? Is there a chance to have sort of the big vision or mission of, of their, their dream of where they want to go at the end of the game? It's very democratic. Uh, and one person, by the way, from the group will write down key words on the poster sheet. It's uh, transparent. Everyone can see what's going on. You get the group values. If there's a mission there already, you honor the existing mission, but you go where the energy is in the room. Very often these things were written, um, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, and it's often by a grant writer, not by the actual folks involved, or by a director, one person, or maybe it was involving a number of participants or staff members. And that was six or seven years ago, and the turnover is 40%. Who does that represent? So you go with the energy is in the room. Don't skip over the step. Folks will want to skip over and say, oh, we've got a mission. I advise you not to. You, you usually, most groups have never had a consensus about where they want to go. This is the opportunity to do it. Otherwise, you're going to get mission creep. You're going to get people going in different directions, et cetera. One of my favorite things that uh, most of you probably have experienced uh, that I'd like to highlight is this issue of giving voice and making meaning. Have you ever been to a meeting and you have a comment or so too, and they're kind of useful, interesting, and they're ignored? Or you're put down for those comments. That's unfortunately very common. But my favorite, someone with much more stature, higher stature, comes into the room, says the exact same thing, and everyone goes, oh, what a great comment. You've experienced it, haven't you? That's uh, not being allowed to give voice or make meaning. In empowerment evaluation, it's the opposite. You are compelled to have your voice heard in various dimensions, as you'll see as we go through this process. By the way, we, we put little notes on the, on the poster board as to what those you know, key phrases for what the mission is. We take that, we paste it on the wall, and we move on. I will maybe connect with someone during lunch or maybe afterwards, and we'll actually draft out a statement, a paragraph or two, and send it out to everyone and say, consensus, can you live with it? Does this sound okay? You have some wording changes, we can wordsmith it. But I don't stop the process to write that up beautifully to get to taking stock. You get the basic idea. People are, have then done what's called mental scaffolding, getting that in their minds to get ready for assessment, and it's on the wall for them to see. Taking stock has two parts. The first part is they just, I ask everyone, please list just all the key activities that make this operation run and uh, help you accomplish this mission. And they'll list communication, fundraising, uh, staffing. I mean, they'll go on and on and on and on. Well, as you already know, for those of us who do evaluation already, you can't do everything. So I give everybody, I know very Marin-like, very California, everybody gets five dots. And trust me, I've seen it all. You can't rip the dots in half. You can't sell the dots. People take them very seriously. You get five dots, and that's it. You put the dots wherever you think are the, or whatever you think are the most important activities to assess as a group from this point on. So if you think communication is the most important thing to assess, you might put all five dots there if you don't think anyone's voting for them. Or you'll put your one dot, you put two dots in maybe fundraising, you put something else in uh, uh, report writing or uh, teaching, whatever it may be. And a lot of colleagues have said, you know, David, it's not very quantitative. I go, well, 
count the dots. Seems pretty quantitative to me. I don't know what school that, you know, they may have gone to. I just, it's a very simple, transparent way of seeing where the group is as far as their priorities are concerned. Trust me, I've done this without the dots. You can take three to four hours versus two to three minutes in the same process. Uh, and in traditional evaluation, you can take three to four months doing a uh, prioritization process. This is very rapid. The mission part's only about an hour. Taking stock, this first part, very rapid. That helps you prioritize. Once again, the question is, what do you think are the most important things for us to assess at this point as a group from this point on? So we're just prioritizing. Now, part two of taking stock, we actually are going to rate them. So this is a real abbreviated example from an accreditation process we went through in San Francisco. And in this part, we take whatever got the most dots, communication was first, teaching was second, funding, this product development was another one. And we actually rated them one to 10. 10, you're doing great, couldn't be better. One, awful. Well, this is a real example. Uh, that's my initials DF over there. And you see a three. Uh, communication, I thought, I was a research director there and a professor as well, was horrendous. Why? They had two meetings scheduled for the same time in the same place as the one we were having, and ours concerned accreditation. So the communication was awful. There's a lot of other reasons they never had an agenda. I mean, it's like, it was incredible. So this other person, happens to be a secretary, gives it a three as well. She's a better social scientist than I because she actually has the written record, the schedule showing the conflict. But given her role, she didn't want to say too much of it about it in the organization. This was a big group, so it was easier to talk about it. So it gives it a six. Dean, great. So she elbows me and says, would you ask him why he's giving a six? Sure. Why are you giving a six when everyone else is giving it a two, a three, and a four? It's very interesting. He said, from my perspective, I think we communicate very well compared to the entire institute. So if we had just done a survey, we never would have had that insight about internal versus external communication. So there and then, we split it into two. You never do that in traditional evaluation, right? You don't want to contaminate the process. You don't want to change it. This makes it more accurate. And he modified it for internal, but kept it higher. And we then thought about what um, we were doing for communicating externally. Let me give you another one really quickly. Product development, that's when you put brochures out or communications out about the school to attract students, et cetera. I gave it a one. I didn't see much of anything going on. Very pathetic. The secretary showed a bit more, she gave it a four. Who gives it, a dean, uh, gives it an eight? The dean. So we ask. This time we find out he has over a thousand brochures go out in a month. He has Friday night and Saturday night sessions opened house for students to come in, prospective students. He has television spots. He has this, this, this. He has an endless amount. He was right. However, he was not communicating internally very well about it because we didn't even know about it. I'm one office away. So my point is, the important part of this is not just the rating, it's the dialogue where you learn and about your own organization. And now I know I have assets that I didn't realize one office away. And that's true of most of us. Most of us don't even know what the person in the next office is doing, even though we've known them for years. This process helps pull that up. Now, what we do also, as you can see, we add, total and average it across. And you can see communication is on average of four. That way, the minority opinion of a nine or a one, that voice is still heard and in your face, but it doesn't dominate just because they're articulate or powerful or whatever. This is very important. This gives us a baseline to work with to know where we are as a group. We also go down, see total it, and then average, uh, and then uh, average, and people go, well, why do you do that? You can sort of see who's optimistic and pessimistic. Unfortunately, you can see I'm a 3.25, but you know, I am an evaluator, right? And the dean, what a surprise, is a 525. So it's kind of fun, uh, but it's more than just fun. It's actually called norming. The next time I say something very positive, they know me from my evaluative, not my cultural, religious, political perspective, but my evaluative core. And go, wow, David thought it was actually positive? Must be something there. So you get to learn from each other where they are based on these kinds of ratings. I also have everyone do each section, like communication, teaching, funding, whatever it may be, first, 
As you list people tell you where they're doing well, they're then more comfortable saying where they're not doing so well. And then I do an average of the averages. Now think about this for a second. I just want to take just, just a moment to reflect on this. If I worked in an organization for a whole two and a half hours coming from California and gave them a four on a 10 point scale, they're gonna say, see you later, go back to California where they won't say anything even worse but not find anything I do credible. If on the other hand, they give themselves a four or a 4.25, they then ask me, David, how can you help us? You see the dynamic that changes with empowerment evaluation, where instead of you being parasitic and secondary, it's part of what they do, and instead of it being something that they don't really buy into and don't want to hear from and not going to follow through as soon as you're gone, and also you walk around with a target on your back as the evaluator and as a messenger, it's more of a hug. They, more, they want you to be involved and get your expertise uh, to help them move forward. Phenomenal dynamic that we're talking about. Now let's run to planning for the future. I don't want to get too tight on time. Uh, we only have a, about five minutes. I'm going to breeze through these pretty quickly and then we'll have a question and answer. Uh, for planning for the future, you have them come up with what their goals are, their strategies, and their evidence. Uh, and those are the goals that are based on what we just assessed, communication, funding, whatever it was. And it should be simple to improve communication. And the strategies come from the evidence they just gave for taking stock. If there's no agenda, that's what you put as a strategy. So you see how powerful the evidence gives you what you need to move forward with. I come up with wonderful strategies to improve communication, but they're irrelevant. They don't address the specific concern. The evidence tells you what it is. I'm going to briefly go through these examples. This is what you can read about, of course, in more detail later, but just briefly broad strokes for today because it's a just a general presentation on, or an introduction to empowerment evaluation. But I want to focus on accountability. We work in Arkansas, focusing on academically distressed schools. You at Packard, we did a very big project, and I have a book on that over here. It's uh, Empowerment Evaluation in the Digital Villages. You at Packard's $15 million race towards social justice. We work in the Stanford School of Medicine and uh, help them get through accreditation and transform their curriculum. And also for the last 10 years, I've been working uh, in Arkansas on tobacco prevention programs. And that one is addressed in much more detail in our book that just came out about a week or two ago, Empowerment Evaluation, uh, Knowledge and Tools for uh, Self-Assessment, Evaluation Capacity Building, and Accountability. This is where we work in Arkansas. Not a lot going on over there, as you can see, very rural. And we've been able to help transform their education, schools in academic distress. You can see we had the red 6.9, 5.2, all these ratings. When we first asked them, what do they think about how we're updating parents, how they're self communicating, et cetera. Then we came up with strategies, how to improve that. And some of them were bad. Electronic bulletin boards to help communicate with parents, pretty bad idea, considering most of them didn't have computers or um, not all had electricity. So we came up with the old-fashioned, put the paper in the backpack, and guess what? By the end of the process, six months, communication, when we rated it again, was great, 6.2. In the period of time we spent with them, and we're not literacy experts or math or anything, we were able to reduce the number of students that were operating at the 25th percentile, which is extremely low, by 59% to 38. No one else had been able to do that, and they were experts in that area. We were just evaluators but we use a feedback loop. Instead of firing everyone, how many people are going to drive all the way down to that town and spend three years or a year and a half or over there? Not many. You work with the folks you have, you build their capacity, and they have phenomenal ideas on how to improve, and you bring in outside folks as well to help them train them in areas where they are weak, and you can have this kind of transformation. Similarly, as I mentioned before, in the $15 million project with Hewlett Packard, one of the groups that we worked with were 18 different tribes in San Diego, and as you can see, we use the same process. On the left in the corner, you can see communication is highlighted. That's always comes up in organizations. We had a tribal elder give the uh, lunch break and benediction to make sure it was culturally relevant and they did buy into it. And this picture is worth $15 million, at least to HP. One of my students took this picture, I'm in the center, and we're video conferencing with folks, uh, Native Americans in San Diego, that was the outcome they were looking for. 
to get them to bridge the digital divide in communities of color. Powerful picture for them. As I said, we work in the School of Medicine also, and we uh, knew that the audience there was, uh, for their journals, was statistical significance. So we established uh, that we were able to accomplish at a P.04, which is uh, um, statistically significant, what our transformation was in the curriculum based on our work. You can read about that a little more in academic medicine. Our work in tobacco prevention in Arkansas, we we're basically ready to lose our shirts. The uh, funding was going to go to some presidential candidate who wanted to use it for obesity. And uh, we had to put our heads together and we agreed, you know what, we're going to start to pool data, which we've never done before, uh, for all these groups that used to compete for the same money, and uh, turn this into the language of power, money. And we were able to show them that individually, the women's group, Asian Pacific, didn't look like much on the charts when you really look at what we did. But if we pool our data, we showed that we were able to save them $84 million in excess medical costs by the kind of work we were doing to keep kids uh, from uh, using tobacco. That is ROI, return on investment. It got their attention and we kept our funding and our work. Finally, I want to show you something about an evaluation dashboard. That's something we're using to monitor our work that I think you can find for anything you do. You put down the goals where your grantees want to go at the end of five years or one year. Benchmarks points along the way for each part of the year or each year. The actual performance where the grantee is now, today. And then based on where they started before. Let me show you what this looks like quickly. This is how simple it is. I have folks look each quarter, because I don't want to wait only and have a five-year one. I want to know where you are and help you get there within the first year. So if you want to have smoke-free parks, you could have something like you already have one. Your baseline is one. Your goal is to have four in a year. Well, once you've decided that, boom, you've got it. It's four for the whole year, for each quarter. Your benchmarks, you're just guessing. I'm going to have one in the first quarter, another one, then two, and then another one, which is three, another one, four, by the fourth quarter. Once you decide that and figure that out and have a, an agreement with your folks you work with in the community, that's all you have to do for the beginning of the year, for the whole year. The only thing they have to do to add to that is their actual performance. In this case, the first quarter was zero. That's a flag. I need help. It's not I did something wrong. I need help. So we get together and we brainstorm folks who are successful and they share their ideas. I share my ideas. We get CDC involved. Next quarter, we're better. One should be at two, but we're getting there. By the third quarter, we're on track and probably going to make it. So we're able to help them monitor their own performance, no one to ask for assistance, and for us to monitor and jump in when we need to. Isn't that pretty cool? Very simple dashboard. Visually, it can look like this. Actual versus benchmark. Boom. So a lot of different ways of visualizing the same thing. We used the bar charts, same thing. This is where we are for the bar chart approach, actual versus um, the benchmark. Once again, just a number of different ways to show that because many folks need different audiences, need different kinds of visualizations. It's all the same. It's actual performance versus where we think we're supposed to be at each quarter. All of this process helps build evaluation capacity, and this process is, can be serendipitous. I didn't plan on this, but in the middle of this, when we were dying, trying to get figures on teenage pregnancy, uh, teenage pregnant women and what their smoking rate was, uh, adults, um, young kids, I mean, it was disaster. We all thought this is murder. So together we thought, you know what, we need to create an Arkansas Evaluation Center to help train minority evaluators, and that's what we did. We got it through the House, got it through the Senate, and the governor signed it. I'm a co-director. I never would have planned it, never would have thought of it. It's just something that could come out of this group process. I'm going to hit a couple of tech tools, then we'll close out for this and open up the question and answer in about uh, two or three minutes. I just want to mention briefly, whatever tools you decide to use, and I use a lot of tech tools when I can, they should align, you should align the tools with the principles of empowerment evaluation. So they should be user-friendly, they should be persuasive, they should be inexpensive or free, uh, and they should uh, invite collaboration. So we use online surveys, which I'll talk about briefly, digital photography, blogs. I want to know how many folks use blogs. We're going to put a little survey really quickly up and um, I'll be going through some of these other things while we're getting the tabulations on it. But tell me how many of you use blogs. Um, and uh, we'll go come back to that in a second. We use picture sharing. So we have a lot of our pictures that we take. We show the one for you, the packet they love. We put it on the web just for our group to be able to access. Um, we have 
shared Google Docs and spreadsheets. Once again, they're tools that are free and they invite you to work with them. If you haven't done Google Docs or played with it, I can be writing something on there and you can then edit and write on my work at the same time and collaborate. Not like track changes with Word, I'm talking about actually changing while we're doing it. That invites a collaborative spirit. We have collaborative websites where I can develop a website and you can put your page on it. Another person can put their page on it. It invites collaboration. Video conferencing, free most of the time wherever you go, with Google Hangout, with Skype, etc. If you don't use it, I really recommend you do. It's free, and once again, it invites that collaboration. Obviously, start out with a face-to-face -face communication, but you're not always gonna have the money to keep on going back and forth, and you wanna maintain that relationship, which is critical. This helps you do it. One of the things I'm very slow on that finally came to realize is uh, a lot of our training, a lot of our work can be put on YouTube for free on somebody else's server, and we can share information. I want to also mention uh, something about infographics and data visualization in a second. Uh, for blogs, we see it looks like, wow, it looks like, no, 42%. I'm going to go back to blogs. I'll come back to the infographics and data visualization in a second, but this is very important. There are many kinds of blogs out there, and they don't have to be about yourself and, you know, people worry they're going to be just narcissistic things. They can be about your project. In this case is also we have the AEA 365 blog, and this I was just writing about Google Glass, which I've been using with my tobacco prevention folks in Arkansas. Uh, very powerful. If you want to read more about it, of course, go online over there. Uh, but more to the point, all right, it's going over this way. Uh, it's going the wrong way. Here we go. Let's get back again. Decided to go reverse for some reason. Um, we use it also for... Um, our collections and our books. We write about what goes on the blog. We refine what happens and we put it into our textbooks. We put it into, if we want to just update folks on our projects, you'll see in these books, just computer screen snapshots of the blogs we use just to highlight what we've done for each of our workshops or exercises. Because by the end of the year, we're not going to remember all of them. But they will have a picture and a description. And it also invites folks to join us. So as I can say, you'll see them in these kind of books in Prime Evaluation Principles of Practice. Uh, we use them also in the early days for foundations of empowerment evaluation. And one of our earliest books will help launch this empowerment evaluation knowledge and tools for self-assessment and accountability. This uh, new one, as you'll see in a minute, I'll show you in a second, is the second edition of that very first one that we just put out a couple weeks ago. So those three keep in mind. The newest ones, as I'm just highlighting right now, are the Empowerment Evaluation in the Digital Villages is the $15 million one, just to remind you. That one I mentioned because I've never gotten as much radio press in my life. I don't know how many 10 different radio programs have asked me to do interviews on it. So if you can figure out why they asked me, just let me know. I don't know if it's the money, $15 million, social justice, HP, you know, I don't know. But whatever it is, it works. I got a ton of, and on the web, if you want to hear them, I'll just check out Fetterman and Radio or go to our webpage, uh, www.davidfetterman.com, and you'll see the radio interviews on the left-hand side. But our newest one that I mentioned is this book. So this is a book I recommend because this came out a couple weeks ago, and the examples are phenomenal. Peruvian women who have used this approach to refine the quality of their crafts that they sell, to sell them on the Internet so as to bypass the millman who's eating up a lot of the profit, I've got my $15 million project on there, as well as our 10-year project on tobacco prevention. Uh, we have fourth and fifth graders using empowerment evaluation. It's just tremendous. Uh, anyway, take a look at this one. Uh, I think we're going to start the question and answer. But yeah. Yep, go ahead. David? I just wanted to give you a quick update and for all the attendees too. We've actually set up a special offer for your book from SAGE, the Empowerment Evaluation Second Edition. If you go to the SAGE website, which is sagepub.com, and if you enter this code, it's just Fetterman14. Again, that's Fetterman14 in the promotional box when you're checking out. There is a 20% discount that we're extending to anyone who's attending this, and that will be good through December 31st. Wow, nice uh, holiday gift. Put that one. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, no, I do, I, I do recommend that highly because the examples, we did start this as just a revision of the book. It's completely gutted and rewritten because so much powerful work is out there after uh, 21 years. Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if we should jump into some questions. We have to wrap up here in just a few minutes, and I did want to get your input on a couple of things people had posed to us during the time together. Yep, sounds good. I just wanted to mention that these are the radio uh, interviews I've had. Take a look at them and listen to them when you want to on the web. And uh, you're right, you're perfect timing. Uh, time for some feedback on uh, questions, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry to jump in there. Uh, this is all such great information. Um, one of the questions that we did get was, can you comment on how empowerment evaluation is the same and different from participatory action research? Yes. Um, let me give the highlight first a big 30,000 viewpoint uh, perspective, and that is first to look at collaborative participatory and empowerment, because that, those are, these are stakeholder approaches to evaluations, how I refer to them. And I've got an article about it in the American Journal for Evaluation. I think it was back in, um, in January. So take a look at that. Um, over here, let's see. In this journal right here, if you haven't seen it yet, um, AJE. And uh, that goes into more detail. But basically, when you're thinking about this and the differences, you think of collaborative as you're in charge as an evaluator and you're collaborating with folks, you're getting their uh, input, their feedback, but you're still running it. In participatory approaches in general, it's shared. Uh, you're basically starting with the lead and you ask for their participation and you try to share that decision making. In empowerment evaluation, you start with the group is in charge and you're the coach or facilitator. That's the basic way to sort of differentiate from the role perspective, the, the, the different approaches. When you get down to participatory action, that's a subset of the participatory. That's why I want to give you the big picture first. And I'd have to give you more detail on that uh, offline if you'd like, because I just wrote a piece uh, about empowerment evaluation and community psychology dealing with also um, uh, uh, participatory uh, action research. Um, so I've got a couple of pieces out about that in more detail. Go ahead. That's great. Uh, when you were talking about taking stock, someone commented, this prioritizing process seems to only take into account the people who are in the room. What about those who are not present? Can they provide prioritization input? Yes, they can. I work in a lot of hospitals and, you know, Stanford, I've been their director of evaluation for a number of years uh, and helped start the department, the divisions, um, after being a professor of the School of Education and the dean called me over to take care of that. Um, you have nurses, you have doctors who can't be there. So you do it offline. We do a lot of our stuff, like we even have a piece on the Mars rover where kids from around the country were involved in participating in that uh, project and, uh, and using it for their understanding of um, uh, basically uh, space travel. Um, and they can all be there, so we did it online. In other cases, so that's one tool to then augment what you do face to face. In addition, there are some secretaries who couldn't come, so I brought the whole sheet to them in that case, or my folks did, depending on uh, if I couldn't handle it myself, and ask them, where are you on this? Um, and have them put their input. But by, by the way, by mentioning that, I should say that there are no zeros or no, I can't, I don't have an opinion, because she, the secretary in this case wanted to say, you know, I don't really know about teaching, you know, I'm not, I can't go into the classes. And I said to her, you know, I don't think so. I actually listen to you when I go by your office and I hear you say, don't take so-and-so's class, but David's got a good class on methods. Uh, so you obviously know something from what you've heard from students. I want to know what your opinion is based on, because your perception of that reality is as important as reality itself, because you're shaping people's behavior by the advice you're giving. And very often, if someone doesn't have a full picture of it, it's good for them to explain that as part of the part of the group and they get sort of educated to it in the process. The same way the dean didn't communicate enough about what he did. I didn't know how much he did. It was important, for, my perception was off because I didn't have the data. By sharing what my perception is, he knew, guess what, he better do a better job communicating. So that's kind of a long-winded approach to, to that. But you can easily get folks in. It doesn't always have to be at that very moment. Although that is the core group you want to work with uh, whenever you can. There's a lot to be said for being uh, inefficient. What do I mean by that? I've made a mistake of saying, oh, you take off on this, you take off on this, and then come back, and then we'll see what we have, and everyone, no one agrees with anyone. Be inefficient in the sense of 
let's take a couple of minutes to go, what do you think we should do for communication? Oh, we should have an agenda, we should do this, this, this. Everybody agree with that? Cool. Now next, next, next. And they go into detail later offline, but get some basic agreements inefficiently by keeping everyone longer than you might have in mind. Sorry, now I want to go to the next question, but uh, that's one way of getting more folks involved in why you do want to have people, if you can, face-to-face -face at first, but I've done a lot of this online as well. Great suggestions. Um, we'll do one more question here, and then the questions that we haven't gotten to today, we'll, we'll send them to David and make sure that he gets us responses that we can post for you all to view. Uh, and I see that he's made his information available to you as well uh, so that you can contact him. Um, I think your, is your email up there, or it's got to be somewhere? If not, if you didn't see it earlier, uh, I'll email to everyone, or you can, and it's uh, FettermanAssociates at gmail.com is the best way to reach me. Terrific. Okay, we'll do one more real quick question, and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, this is uh, from one of our attendees. It says, thank you for the great presentation, Professor Fetterman. Uh, let's say that you conduct an empowerment evaluation with different people, both older and younger. How do you ensure knowledge transfer among generations for effective knowledge utilization? Well, it's very interesting. I, work, I do work across uh, different kind of groups, including uh, generation, uh, generational differences. Uh, what's interesting about this whole process um, is, uh, I mean, I, I respect uh, the culture and the traditions of uh, any of the folks I'm working with, and that includes sometimes uh, making sure elders are heard often first or prioritized in one fashion or another, depending on the group. For example, Native Americans, if you don't have the elders involved, you're not going anywhere, uh, including your report you might write with your group has to still go through the elders. So you have to respect those cultural norms. Um, we also want to make sure that we get the wisdom of both youth and elders. You do skateboarding kinds of things if you don't have the kids involved and their wisdom about what really matters from their perception of reality, you're not going anywhere. Similarly, if you don't get the elders that have actually been involved, seniors have been involved in life for a long time and have seen the same things happen over and over again with different name for them or different packaging, uh, you're going to miss and you're going to reinvent the wheel. So I try to get a cross cut no matter what. In fact, when people tell me, don't get the person that's crazy, that they're, they're paying the neck, I always say, please, I want them. Because they have something irritating, terrible to say about how the director's corrupt, and it raises the ceiling about what can be said comfortably. So I like a full range of folks, even folks that don't fit into the norm. They've per generally been marginalized because of ageism, sexism, uh, whatever it may be, that has made them be more hyperbole, more exaggerated about their ideas because no one's listening so much so that they don't even seem to fit in anymore. Those are wonderful people to actually pull back in if you can. So never mind age differential, but I do try to get quite a range uh, so that people can see what people perceive. Let me just end real quickly if I could with why I think this is so important. It's called the emic or insider's perspective of reality. When I worked in a VA hospital and I worked with in psychiatric ward, there are these folks who think they can fly. I don't mean like you can I, you know, play, I mean fly. And you may not believe it, I may not believe it, but trust me, there are very real consequences for that perception of reality if you're on the third floor of a building with no bars in the window. So the perception of reality, whether we believe it or not, is as important as the functional objective draconian reality out there. So sorry to overemphasize, but that is critical to understanding why it's important to be respectful and understanding of other people's perception of reality. It's as important as any external objective view of it. Oh, that's helpful. Great. Thank you so much, David, for your time today. I really want to um, just take a moment to say thank you for all the time you put into presenting this content and, and gathering it and getting everything ready in the rehearsals. It's been wonderful to work with you. Um, please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view the entire webinar on our website, as well as some answers to the questions that we didn't have time to get to today. And also, please do take that survey in the email that we send to you as your feedback will really help us in shaping future topics for our webinar series. And finally, remember, you can purchase David's book at that 20% discount at sagepub.com using the code FETTERMAN14 until December 31st of 2014. Thanks so much for attending our webinar today. We hope that you'll join us for our next event with Michael Quinn Patton on Wednesday, December 3rd. You can visit sagepub.com slash sage talks, all one word, for more information as it becomes available. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for participating. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.